Right. So um, there are a few things that are very much fundamentally human. We, we speak articulated language. We, uh, we have really wide social networks, like, for example, CIA. Uh, we use culture in an extent that no animal can ever compete with us. I mean, we are sitting in a lecture theater. No other animals can do that. And there's one more, which is we're everywhere. I don't think that if there's an, 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 another species that you could say they, they went, you know, from the moon all the way from the, from the cold to the hot. We are literally wherever you go, humans are there. However, we don't know exactly how those specific human features evolved. We know that they happened in the Paleolithic because they were in there before and they're definitely here now. But how they evolved and, and, and why they evolved is unsure. The problem is that a lot of them you cannot really draw from the data. I mean, a site with tools will not tell you how big somebody's social network was. So the way to do it is to try to simulate the possible mechanisms that would lead to the evolution of those features and then compare it with the data that we have in a, in a way, like kind of predict what kind of record we would expect if our theories are right. And I'm doing one of those. Um, which is called the variability hypothesis. Um, and it was proposed by, by Rick Potts in 1996. He got a nature paper out of it, well done. Uh, he then actually wrote a real long and proper paper, so we know actually quite well what he's on about. And the hypothesis is based on the, um, on the idea that certain organisms are specialists and other organisms are generalists. And they have a fancy name of, I think, stenotypes and neurotypes. Uh, but specialist and journalist actually means something to most of humans. So you can imagine, uh, this is, uh, the first picture is a bear without fur. This is, this is beautiful. I mean, I, when I Googled it, I couldn't believe. So that's a, that's a bear without fur. And you can imagine that such a bear would be perfectly specialized and perfectly adapted to hot conditions, uh, because it wouldn't overheat. Uh, you can have a bear which, uh, has, I Googled as a particularly furry bear. So that's a, that's a bear with a lot of fur. And, and that bear uh, is very well adapted to cold conditions, but you put, them, put it in Africa and it's just gonna, it's just gonna die of, of, of hot. And then you can have a bear that has kind of a medium sized fur. So he's not that well adapted to cold, he's not that well adapted to, 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 um, to hot, but he's, he's doing all right, he's doing fine. So Rick Potts suggested that there's another type of, uh, of adaptation, which is the adaptation to change. And the, and the way you could think about it is a, is a bird that actually sheds fur. So he's adapted both to cold and to hot, but the main kind of focus of the adaptation is the change. And I believe that most of the kind of fundamental human features that I mentioned before are very much such adaptations to change. So in order, instead of being specialized or general or being, having a general adaptability pattern, uh, it's the behavior of plasticity uh, that allows such organisms uh, to kind of prefer resilience over, you know, high level of adaptation. And here I, um, I came up with a few things that I think could be, under, could be understood as that uh, behavior plasticity or versatilis. Uh, it's the, the, our big brains uh, with problem solving, creativity, learning, all of those things allow us to adapt to changing environments very quickly. We have the culture that I already mentioned with dwelling, power, fire, clothing, all of this came in the Paleolithic. Uh, the tools, the fantastic hand axes and, and not that fantastic small tools. Um, and then the social environment. So, you know, you know how you went on holidays and then you had to call your mommy because your money ran out. We do have those social networks. They are very important because if you are in, in, in a lot of trouble, they will, they will save you out. So, so the variability uh, hypothesis has been already formalized, so I didn't have to do that. I was very happy about that by, uh, by Matt Grove in 2011. Um, and what he did, he took a genetic model, which is called the single, single locus model, and he said, okay, we're gonna have three types of genes. The, the hot genes, the cold genes, and the general genes. And from that, you can imagine we have six individuals, and they're hot, hot, hot general, cold general, 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 general. So, like, they have all two slots for the gene, and they can have one of the three genes in each slot. And and then he did this little trick where he added the another kind of fitness boost to the to the to the generalist. 
So he said, okay, so whatever happens, you are adapted to change. So you're getting a tiny, tiny amount of more fitness because, uh, because you, can, you are just better. And so the result of that, I mean, just to, just to make you make it, show it what's happening. Imagine uh, on the right hand side, oh, I can actually point to it. Yeah, so we start, we start here and we do a sine wave of temperature. So first it gets hot and the hot adapted specialists are like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's doing great. And the cold adapted specialists are just like, yeah, okay, we all die. Um, and then, and then the, the sine wave gets from hot to cold and the cold guys are just like, yes, we're, we're gaining ground. Whereas the hot guys are, are in decline. The generalists are doing not great, but okay throughout the whole thing. And so the very subtle is the adding, adding boost is just the, um, the, not the full line. Uh, which just adds a little bit of extra fitness. And then Matt Grove did this fantastic uh, experiment when he introduced the Versatilis in a tiny, tiny proportion of the population. And he ran it uh, first again the sine curve and then against the real environmental record of the temperature in the past five million years, um, which was a pretty genius idea, actually. Um, the result was that uh, he, know, he, he could recognize those time periods when the selection for the, for the organisms that had adapted to change was particularly strong. And that happened between two and a half million years ago and 1.2 million years ago. And all of the Paleolithic specialists here will probably say, wow, that is actually where a lot of stuff was happening and we can see it in the record. So, so that was Matt Gross, um, uh, formalization. And mine, which uh, hopefully will happen within the next two years uh, when I finish, um, uh, is to rewrite the model from a frequency model, from an equation model into an agent-based model. And the reason for that is uh, with a frequency model, you know, the whole population kind of equals to one, which means there's no population growth and it would be difficult to try to introduce it. Also, uh, although all the microbes kind of controlled for that. Uh, you also have those situations when uh, 0 0.0001 uh, kind of bounces up and goes goes up again because it's a frequency. So you never have the kind of proper extinction going on. Um, and that's why I decided to rewrite it into, into an agent model. So the agents re replace the frequencies. And then I could ask things that the frequency model cannot ask. For example, who is dispersing? Or uh, when is dispersal happening on the kind of local le level? Or do you need a versatilist individuals in your group in order to be able to disperse? Or, or are you actually better off if you don't have them? And, uh, and so the, the simulation is uh, very similar, except for I kept the generalist. So, so instead of having uh, six types, I have nine types of agents. And they have two things they like doing in their lives. And both of those things depend on fitness. And they do reproduce, so that, that's, that's their fa first thing. And I used a, a very common algorithm used in uh, computer science uh, and in other disciplines called the roulette wheel in order to, to, uh, to, to model the, the reproduction. So when you imagine a roulette wheel, a standard one, uh, each slot has the same size, at least you hope, because that's what you're putting your money on. So, so each slot has the same probability of the ball falling into that slot. Um, in the roulette wheel uh, algorithm, it's a little bit different. So each slot is one agent, but each slot has a different size depending on how good the fitness of that individual, one, uh, individual is. So the result is that uh, the blue guy there, the, the number three, uh, he has the best chance of having a child. However, it doesn't preclude the poorly adapted guys from also having occasionally a child, it's just in the grand scheme of things, in the long run, it will happen less often. So, so I use the roulette wheel. And uh, I choose two parents with that, and then the child gets two, uh, gets one gene from each parent chosen at random. And then they, they can migrate. Uh, and this is, a, uh, this is the key element that you couldn't uh, introduce in the previous model. So, um, so the probability of migrating, I actually have to think about it a lot, and uh, it's one of the major reasons why I'm presenting, because I'm curious what people, other people think about it. 
we've been talking about migration and dispersal for so long. And then I sat down and had to write this model. I was like, actually, who's, the, who's migrating? Is it the people with high fitness? Because they can, because they're doing great and they can just go on and they will be probably still doing great. Or is it the guys that are not doing that great and they either go or die? I mean, we've never actually talked about it, which is, uh, seems to be a big gap because we do a lot of chatting about random things like this. So I decided, um, and people probably will disagree, and I'm happy with that because we can do alternative um, uh, implementation then, that the worse adapted you are, the more likely you are to disperse because you are the one that is pushed. You are the, the poor cousin that nobody wants to hang out with because you're always mm -hmm. trouble. Um, and then the way I model it is, um, you know, we have the grand carrying capacity uh, of the environment, so that the biomass and we know how much energy there is, but then your fitness determines how much energy can you get from that environment. So if you're poorly <coughs> adapted, you're not a good hunter, it doesn't matter how many mammoths there are, you're still not doing great. So I use the carrying capacity uh, to kind of push the agents who are the, who are the, uh, to determine the probability of each agent moving to another cell. So again, it is a stochastic process. And, um, and I could show you the equation, but uh, this is going to confuse everyone. Uh, so, the, um, in our, uh, so I'm not doing a fully random walk. I actually go do, uh, I'm actually doing a, uh, a localized uh, walk because uh, as you disperse, you actually choose the best cell for you, not for other guys in your group, but the ones that is the best for you. Uh, in the in the closest neighborhood. Okay, and um, the first thing I did is um, I tried to verify if my model actually stands the way, if it's actually doing what I think it's doing. And the best way to do that was to replicate the previous equation-based model. Um, so in order to do that, I had to I had to get the population size into a static one, so there's no population growth. And that migration is completely switched off because that's not in the original um, uh, model. In order to kind of replicate the frequency, the fact that people don't really die off or anything like that, I just use a very large population. So that should uh, limit the stochasticity. Um, and I just did the same. I initiated the population with one person per list. And this is the, the result of the, of the months of hard work um, I do seem to be replicating the general pattern. So in this, um, in this graph, uh, the gray and black bits are uh, coming from the, from the formal model. Um, I didn't test it on the whole length, and here we will learn why agent base is not that great sometimes, because it takes forever. Uh, maybe if you have a computer scientist on the team, <laughs> it takes less time. Um, but I obviously couldn't do as many, you know, couldn't do a, such a full sweep as 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 uh, <coughs> growth could. So um, those are the different types of how fast environment the environment changes, and depending on how fast it changes, the the versatilists they they kind of gaining hold. If it changes very fast, they gain hold very quickly. If uh, if it changes uh, slowly, uh, they actually don't within what's been tested. So I seem to be replicating that, and this is the the major result because it means that not only the previous model uh, seems to be working on a more stochastic and more kind of explicit simulation, but also my model, when it's constrained, seems to be uh, corroborating with the with the previous one. And uh, because this whole session was um, was sponsored by the words "work in progress," um, that was my main conclusion and main uh, results. Uh, the next steps are really simple, which is uh, to switch the migration on and see what's going to happen. And then in order, in order to, uh, to gain uh, some better understanding of how this would all change, I can, for example, run my, my uh, agents on the different environments, on the gradient from hot to cold, or from, on the gradient from hot to cold to hot again, uh, and see if they, for example, follow their own habitats. Um, and, and create non-homogeneous landscapes for the carrying capacity that is underlying it, the global one. Um, so the next step will be that, and I will also probably use the, the uh, real environmental data rather than just the sine curve, but for the general processes, I think that's, that's good for now. All right, thank you.